one thing or another with all this tech stuff. But um, welcome to everybody that's joining us on Facebook. And we're going to have a great conversation tonight. But in the meantime, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Warwick's and how you can participate. Um, for those of you that don't know, that might be joining us from outside of the San Diego area, Warwick's is located in La Jolla, San Diego, California. And we, since the shutdown occurred, we've actually been open for business since the middle end of May, something like that. So if you are in the San Diego, uh, La Jolla area, come by and see us. Um, it's great to browse books. We have a whole other side of the store that has beautiful pens and jewelry and, and lovely leather. So um, come by and visit us. But for tonight's event, I will be putting in both Bill and Roy's books into the comment section. So you can easily click on that and we will send you those books right away. Um, you can also uh, participate in tonight's event by uh, commenting in that section. If you have any questions, um, you can put them in right away or you can you know, wait till more towards the end, whatever you'd like, but we'll bring those to Bill and to Roy as um, they conclude their conversation. So with that, I'm going to do a little bit of an intro and then we'll toss it off to these two fine gentlemen for a great conversation. So Roy A. Mills, MD, is a clinical professor of orthopedic surgery at UCLA. The author of several medical books, he has practiced research and taught hand surgery for 40 years. He has served as president of the American Society for Surgery of the Hand and has also been on the editorial board of the Journal of Hand Surgery for most of his career. He lives in Los Angeles and will be talking about his new book, Bones Inside and Out. And Roy Shutt is a professor of biology at LIU Post and a research associate in residence at the American Museum of Natural History. Bill Shutt. Received... Bill, what did I say? What did I say? Roy. Did I say Roy? Oh, you're both. I was saying both your names and I was like, ah. That was, that was my pen name. I'm flattered, I'm flattered. <laughs> and there's probably no way I could edit this out. So sorry about that, Bill. We just gave, we just gave you a new nickname. That's my new pen name. <laughs> Roy and Roy are going to talk to each other tonight. <laughs> Sorry about that, Bill. I was so caught up on saying your last name right, I completely blew your first name. <laughs> so let's go back to, you are a, a research associate in residence at the American Museum of Natural History. He received his PhD in zoology from Cornell University and did his postdoctoral work at the AMNH, where he was a recipient of a Theodore Roosevelt grant. His first book, Dark Banquet, Blood and the Curious Lives of Blood-Feeding Creatures, was selected as a best book of 2008 by Library Journal. Shutt lives with his family on Long Island, and he will be discussing his new book, Cannibalism, A Perfect Natural History. So with that, Bill and Roy, have a great conversation. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Well, it's really nice to be here. Uh, great to be invited to such a, a, a cool venue. Uh, I'm going to start off by, by asking Roy some questions. And, and the, the first is, Roy, what motivated you to write Bones and, and how long have you been working on it? Well, I think it depends on when you want to start counting. I, um, growing up, either was uh, outside um, interested in natural history or in the basement workshop uh, working on uh, wood. And so with that background, I don't think anybody was too surprised when I went to college and majored in biology and then went on to medical school and then did an orthopedic surgery uh, residency. And that's really where I began to appreciate the marvelous uh, qualities of a uh, bone, uh, seeing it in all of its possible disease states and seeing how that it could heal and rebound. And then it was about uh, eight years ago, looking back on my computer notes that I had begun to make an outline uh, about uh, a book and, and uh, walked around with that until about three years ago when I uh, acquired an agent, uh, Jillian McKenzie, and then she helped me uh, find a, an editor, Quinn Doe, at W.W. Uh, w. Norton. And so then uh, the book's been in actual production uh, for about two and a half years, and it, it actually just came out uh, this past Tuesday. Several times in the book, you indicate that that bone is the world's best building material. Can, can you tell us why you think that? Oh, thank that, man. I, I believe that, uh, that through and through. And uh, uh, I was pretty sure of that before I started doing my research, but I'm absolutely convinced of that now. And anyone pro probably by the end of this interview 
I hope was convinced of it, but if you're not, well then read the book and I guarantee you, you'll be convinced of it too. But that uh, beginning with it's a composite uh, structure of a, a collagen a fiber a meshwork on which uh, is embedded a particular calcium uh, crystal. So it's a composite um, material that would be a little bit analogous to uh, putting uh, plaster on lath uh, so that it has some resiliency, but it really has great uh, uh, strength against uh, the compression of forces. And that's what we need in our endoskeleton. And so it, it's a marvelous material to begin with. The uh, calcium crystal uh, has a particular property that's known to some crystals where that when you put uh, pressure on it, when you compress this crystal, it generates a small electric force and that uh, bone cells are attracted to this force. And so that uh, after a fracture or if we uh, stimulate our bones say by playing tennis all summer is that the bone cells uh, follow these uh, minute electrical forces and uh, reinforce uh, the bone. So it uh, repairs itself and reinforces itself. And the, the bridge uh, built out of uh, steel or, or wood uh, can't do that. Also, bone grows longer with its owner uh, so that uh, a bridge can't double its length just because the river gets wider, but a, a bone can. And then uh, that summarizes the uh, virtues of bone in its living state. But then once the original owner is done with it is that some bones become fossilized and as such may uh, reappear hundreds of millions of years later. And really they're only, they are our only connection uh, with the uh, ancient uh, past. We know nothing about dinosaurs or early fish uh, if it weren't uh, for the bones in the uh, uh, fossil record. And so that it really does connect us with uh, ancient uh, uh, natural history. So uh, I hope you can tell I'm, I'm high on bone. <laughs> so, so why is the question, how many bones are there in the human body? Why is that a trick question? Well, it depends on, on who you ask, I suppose, in journalism, you know, you want to know uh, who, what, why, when, where, and it's a sort of the same thing here is that a radiologist and orthopedist uh, uh, is going to look more uh, carefully a paleontologist, despite their best efforts, is not going to be able to find the middle ear bones out of any animal that they um, um, dust out of the rocks. And then it's sort of arbitrary. Most of us have 12 sets of bones, but it's not unusual for people to have 13 or even 14 sets of bone, but those people don't get their extra bones counted. Also, uh, when infants are born, they have many more bones. They have about 270 bones rather than the standard adult count of 206. And most of these are in the skull. And this allows for great flexibility of the skull as it passes through the birth canal. And then these bones are fused uh, together. And then sometimes the wrist, uh, for no good reason, uh, two bones will uh, fuse into, uh, into one. There's a little one about the size of a blueberry behind the uh, uh, knee. Uh, it's uh, not counted, whereas the uh, ones in the middle ear, uh, which are much smaller, uh, they are counted. And so it's, it's, uh, it's nuanced. And so if uh, somebody asks you, uh, you can hedge and say, well, it depends on you know, who's counting, you know, when are they looking, you know, where are they looking, and uh, why do they want to know? So you've divided your book into two sections, bone concealed and bone revealed. Can you explain that? Well, it was a nice rhyme and it was a nice easy way to divide it, but the, the first half is uh, describes living bone, uh, the nature of it, the uh, structure of it, and uh, names for the bones and why they're named as they are. And then also there discuss uh, alternate uh, skeletal support systems uh, of uh, calcium exoskeleton that the uh, clams and uh, snails make great use of, and the chitin exoskeletons that uh, spiders and uh, insects make uh, uh, great use of, and discuss the relative merits <coughs> of those, and then go on to uh, discuss uh, how uh, fractures uh, heal, and then the other <coughs> maladies of a bone in terms of uh, tumors and arthritis and uh, osteoporosis. Seems to be everybody's interested in that uh, these days, and, and then <coughs> talk about the history of orthopedic surgery and some of the 
innovative things that have been done, discuss uh, six of the giants in orthopedic uh, uh, surgery that have really advanced the uh, specialty. Um, explain to people in entirely lay terms about the various imaging techniques that are used today, and then finish up the first section uh, on <clears throat> bones concealed with the, the future of, uh, uh, of living bone. And then in the second section, I go into what happens to bone after the original user is finished with it. And the first part of that is uh, how uh, bones uh, decay naturally uh, and what we might end up seeing on the desert floor uh, some years after the animal dies. And then discuss the various uh, uh, funeral uh, rites that uh, cultures and uh, different uh, civilizations have used and how uh, these uh, tell us uh, not only about bones, but that when we find these thousands of years later, also give us uh, great uh, leads on terms of what that, that culture was like. Um, bones have been um, useful in business and the fertilizer business in the 1900s, in the button making industry, if you can believe that, in the uh, 1300s. And so I discuss bones in business and then also discuss um, uh, bones and domestic use, uh, they've certainly had great use for the indigenous people with uh, arrow points and uh, spear points and then at home for uh, root picks and spoons and uh, louse killers and uh, earwax spoons and uh, you name it. Uh, bones have been uh, used uh, uh, for uh, uh, gaming. Uh, a lot of dominoes and dice are made out of bones and the original dice really were uh, ankle bones out of uh, a goat. And that's where the expression comes from, roll the bones, because the original dice games were with uh, uh, goat bones. And then I finish up uh, bones uh, revealed with a section on uh, art and the various artists who have uh, painted uh, skulls uh, through the uh, centuries and coming up to uh, modern times with George O'Keefe and uh, my hero, uh, Henry Moore, uh, who lived on a pig farm and uh, uh, used uh, the pig bones that he would uh, pick up on the farm as he uh, walked around as inspiration uh, for his sculptures. And this is particularly seen in his uh, abstract sculptures of uh, reclining uh, women. Um, so th that's how the bone, that's how the book uh, uh, divides up. So uh, what about the future of concealed bone? Are there any sort of exciting medical advances on the horizon? Well, uh, yes, uh, the, I think, what people are really interested in these days is not so much orthopedic, but the uh, osteoporosis and, and how to prevent it and uh, how to treat it. And of course, as the population ages, is that that becomes more and more of an issue. And even more so in that regard is uh, planning uh, prolonged uh, space missions, a, a mission to Mars, and that we need to uh, walk on our bone every day to stimulate those calcium crystals to generate that electrical impulse in order to keep our bones strong. And that underlies the uh, advice that uh, one should walk uh, uh, vigorously or jog uh, five or six days a week. And that is to keep your bones strong and, and not have uh, fragility fractures in the spine or uh, hip. Uh, but on the way to Mars, there's no gravity. And uh, if, you, if you try to walk on the treadmill, uh, you just uh, float off of it. And so for mechanical means, they thought about magnets, but the magnets aren't going to work in the space uh, 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 capsule because of all of the electronic equipment. And uh, they have tried to use bungee cords to uh, attach to a harness and then attach the other end of the bungee cord to the um, uh, treadmill uh, to uh, provide some resistance. But I think that the improvement there uh, that's in the works is going to come from um, chemistry. And that uh, a clue to this uh, is uh, hibernating uh, uh, bears because interestingly, they can be entirely indolent for four or five months out of the year and, and then come out in the spring and they have not lost any bone mass. And so believe it or not, there are uh, investigators who sneak into the caves, uh, sedate the bears, uh, uh, draw their blood, go back to the lab and uh, uh, see what it is different about bear metabolism that keeps them from, from getting osteoporosis. And, and so there's a really bright future there. And also the uh, techniques and the imaging te uh, techniques for orthopedic surgery and the implants that we use and the imaging techniques uh, continue to come along. And so it's a, it's a really bright future for uh, concealed bone.
What was the toughest thing about writing the book? Uh, undoubtedly, uh, running down the uh, permissions to um, print uh, copyrighted uh, figures. I have about 150 figures in the book. Uh, some of them are my own uh, patients or some of my own uh, photographs from museums and so forth, but uh, uh, worldwide trying to uh, identify who owned uh, copyrights and then uh, pursuing them and reminding them that I needed a, a release with the eyes dotted on it uh, to uh, meet the copyright um, uh, restrictions. And then the other thing that was just tedious was I have about 400 uh, references and a lot of them have uh, unusual names in them and the uh, format was uh, difficult, uh, but that was just tedious to uh, uh, get those uh, references lined up to uh, satisfy the publisher. Uh, yeah, I, I thoroughly recommend having a, a world famous artist do your figures for you rather than have to hunt down uh, who owns that photograph. I, I think in every book I've ever written, I've, I've never used a photograph. I just, uh, one of my best friends is Patricia Wynn and she's uh, fantastic. And it's, it's funny that you say that as far as why it's difficult for me. I, I never ran into that one before. I, I hope not to. Well, knowing what I know now, uh, I thoroughly recommend writing fiction that doesn't require any references and, and not including any images. <laughs> so uh, my readers love a, a good gross out. Uh, are there any aspects of uh, your research that, that are, are people might consider to be repugnant or disgusting? Uh, nothing that comes into the range of what we're gonna talk about with your book, but that uh, uh, as a lover of bones, I, I pick up uh, roadkill. I have my medical school classmate from uh, Anchorage, Alaska, uh, send me uh, moose legs, uh, FedEx, uh, so that I can bury them in the backyard and uh, harvest the um, bones that once the bacteria have, uh, have cleaned them up. Uh, really, there are three ways to clean bones, and I use the analogy of the Marines that can uh, approach by uh, land, sea, or air, and that uh, all of them have their uh, benefits. The uh, land and air ones are the uh, stinkiest, and I know that I'm not the only bone lover that has uh, uh, bones sequestered in a metal uh, mesh uh, box uh, on the roof of my house in a place where the neighbors can't see it and my wife can't see it. <laughs> but the, <laughs> there's plenty of ventilation up there. Uh, and, but as a biologist, uh, I've pretty much my whole life have uh, uh, been around some uh, stinky uh, materials. And so uh, that, was, uh, th that was the worst. I was, um, I was looking at your blog site uh, about bone.com the other day. And, and with Halloween coming up, I, I just thought it was really thoughtful of you to provide your uh, recommendations for uh, anatomically correct skeletal costumes. Can you talk about that for a yeah, bit? That, that blog post was called An Orthopedist Guide to Skeleton <laughs> Costumes. Uh, but that I, I did a little bit of research back and the uh, best I could tell is that uh, there were people going to costume parties as early as 1831 uh, dressed uh, in uh, skeleton uh, costumes. About three weeks after Rinkin had uh, ex uh, ex uh, discovered x-rays in 1895 is that there were people going to mask balls in uh, ball gowns that uh, had embroidered uh, rib x-rays uh, on them. And then of course uh, today on Amazon you can uh, see all sorts of skeleton uh, costumes and I critique them in terms of their uh, anatomical uh, correctness. And if you really want to be an admirer and respectful of bones, well, then you should have a costume that uh, at least has long sleeves and long legs, if not hands and feet on it, and that uh, it shouldn't have any fishtail skirts or uh, sleeveless uh, t-shirt uh, tops or uh, plunging uh, necklines. And so if you want to go to aboutbone.com, you can uh, see in detail uh, how the best way for a bone lover to dress for Halloween. So what's up next? What's on deck? What are you doing book-wise? Well, I'm, I'm an inveterate teacher and uh, I want to do a, a children's version of uh, this same book, a, a middle grade uh, reader to excite uh, people about uh, taking an interest in science, technology, engineering, and uh, math. That's so important for an informed uh, uh, population, even if they don't uh, accept a career in them uh, themselves. And so I'm 
going to try to make it exciting for them, uh, cite some of the people uh, who have uh, ended up winning Nobel Prizes as a result of their interest in bone. I'm also going to explain this concept of you know, vast time uh, in a way that they can understand. I mean, for instance, uh, uh, dinosaurs appeared about 245 million years ago. Well, that's certainly going to draw a blank stare in any 10 year old's uh, eye. But if I can tell them that that is the number of years that there are Cheerios in seven tank trucks full of Cheerios, then they can begin to get an idea that that is a really, uh, a really big uh, number. Or to uh, say that, um, uh, let's see, um, I can describe briefer periods of time in the numbers, uh, number of juice glasses uh, filled with Cheerios or number of uh, baseball caps. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going to really make it, uh, make it fun and hope to get them excited about STEM topics. Excellent. Can't wait to read it. OK, let's turn the tables here. Uh, I, I majored in biology, majored in uh, zoology, and uh, some of your uh, research and your professional publications uh, Lucy, uh, Julie mentioned, your, or maybe you mentioned your interest uh, with uh, uh, vampire bats, but that you also had a, uh, at least one article uh, on the mating practices of a, a tree dwelling uh, mouse uh, that has a pouch. And, uh, and then uh, I took a particular interest as a hand surgeon in your uh, articles about uh, vampire bats and the fact that these uh, walk on their hands. And so I think with that background, it, it shouldn't surprise us that then you uh, wrote this book, uh, Dark Banquet, you know, Blood and the Curious Lives of Blood Feeding, uh, blood, um, feeding Creatures. And I, I think that was your first book. And then you followed that up with actually several novels. And then from what you told me the other day is that you have a, a book on the uh, launching pad to come out next fall uh, about, the, uh, about the heart. Yeah, and so I, I don't, think we should be surprised with this sort of eclectic uh, background in fiction and um, eclectic uh, uh, biology uh, that uh, you should uh, come up with a, uh, a book about uh, cannibalism. But I want to hear from you uh, what uh, decided to make you want to write a book about cannibalism. Well, on social media, let's say I haven't talked to somebody in 30 years or so, and they get a hold of me and, and they're like, well, what have you been doing? And I've said, well, you know, I, I study vampire bats. And then I wrote a book about uh, blood feeders. And, uh, and then I wrote another book about cannibalism. No one is surprised. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, when I was, uh, when I was a kid, I was always into zoology. I was always into strange animals. I was always into the macabre. I'm, I'm a big um, a movie buff, Alfred Hitchcock, uh, especially. And so when I, um, when I went for my PhD at Cornell and, and my mentor there, John Hermanson, studied bats, it probably took me about uh, five minutes to figure out that among the 1,500 species of bats that, that, that exist, roughly 1,500, uh, only three of them are vampires. And those are the three bats that I decided to work on. So I started to work on um, on vampire bats. And it was at a time, or I started in 1990, my PhD program, when, um, when not very much had been, was known about two of the three vampire bats. And so there it was really an open book for me to walk into and, uh, and, and just do all sorts of cool research comparing them. Um, and, and um, from there, um, you know, I got around to writing a book about blood feeders and, and I wanted to look at it from the point of view as a, of a zoologist. I'm also a teacher. I just took an early retirement at Long Island University, uh, but, I, but I sort of pride myself on being able to take gross, disgusting concepts, difficult concepts, uh, and then making them entertaining and, and, and then cutting out the, um, uh, you know, cutting, cutting out all the heavy wordplay. And, and so, um, so, so that became Dark Banquet. And, and at the time I was really lucky because things like bed bugs, well, <laughs> lucky that bed bugs were exploding in the United States. That's probably not the best thing, <laughs> maybe the best way to phrase it, but, but bed bugs were huge in, in, in the US and they still are. And, and Lyme disease was huge with ticks. Um, so, so there was a lot of really interesting stuff to talk to and a lot of uh, neat characters to, uh, to interview. So I got in interested in demystifying those types of topics, 
You know, when you think of vampirism, you have a knee-jerk reaction to it. By the same token, when I moved on to my next book, you have the same type of knee-jerk reaction uh, with, with, with cannibalism. And so I've been able to sort of find a niche between the really highly sensationalized books that are out there and the academic works that that that, that most people are not going to read, uh, except if you're a specialist. So finding that slot in the middle has been a place where where I've I've had some um, some fun, uh, and I've been really lucky. I've been working with amazing people. Uh, Jillian McKinsey is also my agent. Uh, very very happy to say. Um, so cannibalism really seemed like a like a, a natural follow up to something about uh, uh, you know about blood feeding and I, I went a little bit more mainstream with my next book Pump, uh, which is going to be about the natural history of the heart and circulatory system. But I'm doing some really weird takes on it as well. It's not really a a, a straightforward. It's nothing like a textbook. We'll put it that way. <laughs> Am I surprised, Bill? I don't think so. <laughs> in, in your book. Uh, here it is, cannibalism, uh, a perfectly natural history. Uh, you write uh, about uh, praying mantises, and I looked it up to make sure, but praying is P-R-A-Y-I-N-G, and that's because of their the posture of their uh, forelegs. Uh, but that in terms of the female, I think it could also be appropriately called praying P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, mantis. And then you, so you wrote about praying mantises and, and their mating habits, and then also a, a species of uh, spiders uh, where the male uh, mates and then partially gives himself up uh, to the uh, uh, female. So in situations like this, uh, what's in it for the guy? Um, and over uh, what range of species uh, in the uh, natural world do you see uh, cannibalism and, and what purpose uh, does it uh, Sure, particularly for the fellow who uh, gives himself up. Yeah, I, I'll answer that first question. And and basically, what if you're looking at a male praying mantis, uh, or a um, or, or several different species of spiders that where the male is much much smaller than the um, uh, than the female, and and if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, this is a, a male that is probably never going to encounter another female. And, and when he does, he wants to mate with her. And, and what better way to ensure that the, the carrier of your genes is going to be healthy than to provide her with a meal at the end of, uh, of, of, your, uh, uh, of your encounter? And so, so that's, you know, that's what the males get out of it in those instances. But, but then to move on to the second part of your question, it was a real surprise to me, and it was a real surprise to a lot of people until relatively recently, the last 20 years or so, that cannibalism wasn't, you know, in the animal kingdom, it was thought of as if, if, if cannibalism takes place if there's not enough food, or if you take a, an animal and you stick them into an uh, inappropriate cage or something like that. Um, but over the course of 20 years or so, a lot of scientists started to come out with papers that indicated that cannibalism was not only widespread across the entire animal kingdom, but took place for reasons that had absolutely nothing to do with a lack of food um, or, or, or stressful captive conditions. So you had things like uh, parental care. Um, so another spider here, black lace weaver spider. Uh, they lay these eggs uh, that, that are never gonna hatch and the, and, the, and the babies, when they hatch from their eggs, eat these eggs. Uh, but when those eggs run out, as the babies grow, they have to molt in order to grow larger. They have to shed their skin. Um, and in order to do that, um, they need more food and the eggs are gone. So what the mother does is she sort of hunkers down in her web. She uses her little petty palps to sort of drum little drum action to call them. Uh, and then they gather around her and they consume her. Uh, and it's kind of like they don't tear her apart. Uh, they, it, it, it's kind of like, um, a, you know, a, a giant spider flavored Slurpee is, uh, and, and they get enough nutrition uh, to survive. So that's, that's an example of parental care. Then there's a lifeboat strategy. You have birds like egrets and owls and they lay their eggs asynchronously. So they, not all the, of the eggs are laid at the same time. And the, so the, the, the egg that hatches last is gonna be the smallest of the, of the, of the, uh, of the birds mm -hmm. um, and nestlings. And so if there's not enough food, then the two larger uh, birds will, will eat the, the smaller bird. Then you have, to me, which was one of the most interesting, was that cannibalism is a, is a hedge against unpredictable environmental conditions. And I went out to Arizona and I worked with, um, with, with scientists 
who were studying this incredibly cool toad called the spadefoot toad. And when they invited me out, they said, well, you know, we have these transient ponds that the toads lay their eggs in. And people know that toads' uh, eggs will turn into tadpoles and tadpoles will spend time in the water and then they'll crawl out onto land. Um, but when I got out to Arizona, I was shocked to see what they were calling a transient pond. Here on Long Island, it would be if it rained and then somebody sort of peeled out in a, in a puddle, uh, that would be the transient pond. So with the arid conditions that they have there, these ponds can, can evaporate really quickly. Now, if you're an egg developing into a tadpole and you are not out of the pond or out of the pool before um, that, that, that pond evaporates, then you're dead. So what has evolved is that half of approximately half of the eggs will hatch into tadpoles that will explode in size. And rather than munching on algae, which is what most of the smaller tadpoles are doing, these large tadpoles will cannibalize their smaller brothers and sisters. They'll develop quicker and they'll get out of the pool uh, and they'll be able to survive. So it's sort of a, a hedge against the fact that where you lay your eggs may not be there tomorrow. Um, then there was a, re, you know, cannibalism as a reproductive strategy. A, uh, a, 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 a big cats, for example, um, um, sea lions. If they are uh, encounter a female who has a young, uh, then then that, that that female is not sexual is is not receptive to mating, and uh, and males will oftentimes kill the young and eat them in order to make the to terminate the maternal investment that the mother has in the young, so that she will then mate with him. So this was, I mean, this went on and on across the entire animal kingdom. And, you know, to me, that was a, that was a, a real surprise and, and something that I got to spend a lot of time doing. Right. So it's, it's almost like it's the original food packaging. You know, you pack up a, a, a bottle for your baby. Uh, oh, yeah. If you have, I mean, if you lay a million eggs, then, then you're not looking at the, if a codfish lays a million eggs. It's not looking at them going, well, it's Teddy and Alice and Jen, Jenny. Of it. You know, this, it's like the equivalent of, uh, of raisins. So you're not thinking of them as, as, as your kids. You're thinking of them as a, as a food source that's not going to uh, cause you uh, any problems. Okay, well, if the audience is beginning to squirm just a little bit, well, let's let's turn it into uh, a human situation. And why do you think cannibal, cannibalism has become what might be considered the ultimate uh, taboo? Yeah, I think uh, you you really have to think of this term "culture is king," and I'll go back to it. But but the in Western culture, the the ancient Greeks, and we're talking about uh, as far back as as Homer and the Odyssey and 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 his hero Odysseus. Um, the ancient Greeks decided back then that that cannibalism, that eating uh, other humans was about the worst thing that you could possibly do to another person. And so their writings reflected that. And it was picked up by the Romans. Um, and then from from the Romans, uh, it went into, it, it just spread all over the place. The Brothers Grimm, for example, in their fairy tales, um, Shakespeare, cannibalism is the worst thing you can do. Sigmund Freud uh, was knocking it. Um, and then once you got into scientists, uh, by the early 20th century and the late 19th century, early anthropologists, when they went out and, and, and met new um, indigenous people, they were expecting them to be cannibals. So it sort of just um, uh, snowballed. Um, and now we have this knee-jerk reaction whenever the term is mentioned. But if you go to places, if you go to countries that, that did not get that memo, that cannibalism was the worst thing that you can do, places like ancient China, you're going to find a very, very different way of thinking about cannibalism. And, and that's why, you know, really one of the themes of this book was that that culture is king. It depends on where you are. There, there are tribes in, in, in New Guinea, for example, where, uh, where they don't bury their dead, they, they consume their dead. And they're just as freaked out when, when they hear about uh, modern human, uh, Western humans rather, uh, burying their dead. Uh, you know, why do you want to put your loved ones in the ground? Why wouldn't you want to incorporate them into yourselves? And you know, is this, uh, is this a good time to uh, have you say a little bit about mumia? Yeah. Well, um, medicinal cannibalism was really one of the other things. So it was a big shock to me when I wrote the book. What, the first thing was just how widespread cannibalism in the animal kingdom was. And the second was that given this taboo that went all through Western culture for, you know, now several thousand years, when you get into Europe uh, for, for 
three, 400 years, right up into the early 20th century, medicinal cannibalism was huge. Drinking blood, eating fat, um, grinding up bone. You've probably, I'm sure you've heard of that and mixing it in, in elixirs. But then there was a run, and, and this is in the, 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 the late 19th century, there was a run on mummies. And people thought that grinding up mummies and putting them into different medicinal potions was going to be a cure-all. And what it was was a mistranslation of an Egyptian word, mumia, which is, means sort of tar. And so when, when, when it was translated, they saw this and they said, oh, mumia is something that you could use on wounds and it's good for you. We can, let's, let's eat that. So mumia wound up being used for a, a long time, right up until the 20th, early part of the 20th century, mumia appears in the Merck index, which is uh, someplace where, where you wouldn't expect it uh, in the 20th century. So to extend that a little bit, you write about how cannibalism is tied to the concepts of, uh, of prejudice and uh, colonialism. Uh, explain that, please. Yeah, uh, the, the example that I gave was uh, everybody's sort of least favorite explorer nowadays, and that's Columbus. And when to, to, to make this brief, and I go into it really fairly in depth, um, when Columbus came to the New World, uh, they were looking for gold. And they when they didn't find gold, um, what they found the next most valuable resource were, were, were humans. And so uh, on his initial trip, he describes the Arawaks that he found as these peaceable people and they're ready to serve and become good Christians. Uh, but, but he was expecting to find gold and when he didn't find it, the next, um, you know, his next trip to the new world, you know, you were 1500 soldiers and, and it was more like an invasion. And so these uh, previously nice, uh, indigenous people were suddenly labeled as cannibals. Uh, and so, and I think this had come from the fact that he had reported back to Queen Isabella that there were that there was a nasty group of cannibals that, that, that he'd been told about and they were called the cannibs. And so Queen Isabella said, well, be nice to the people who aren't cannibals, but you could really do whatever you want if you, if you find these cannibals. So lo and behold, on his next trip back, guess what? Everybody was a cannibal. Uh, so they were, uh, the, cultures were destroyed, uh, crimes that would make, uh, you know, Adolf Hitler blush uh, were, 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 uh, were, were commonplace. Uh, and so I think that this is a lot of the reason why people are now having a problem with celebrating, uh, with, with celebrating uh, Columbus. Well, um, Bill, you're certainly uh, a man who practices what you preach, uh, the Times of London said uh, Shutt is a biology professor um, with a rare gift for making biology uh, dramatic. His accounts are hair-raising, gripping, and often uh, disturbing. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your adventure uh, to Texas to uh, eat the placenta. Yeah. Um, so I'd say that the last vestige of medicinal cannibalism that exists today, and it's a form of alternative medicine, is, is if, if once you give birth that you consume your placenta in order to replenish the hormones that are lost when you lose your placenta. And so there are people who, who have made a living of, uh, of um, finding clients who are giving birth, taking the placenta, um, putting it through some of the same processes that you would do if you were gonna make beef jerky, but then grinding it down and make it into a capsule, encapsulating it. Or you could take fresh placenta and, and make a Slurpee out of it, or, or, or you could mix it up into any type of recipe that you, um, that, that you can think of. And so I was writing about this and it, my, my classes had just started, it was um, uh, fall. And, um, and I contacted a woman in, in, in Texas to interview her over the phone. And, and, and so she gave me the lowdown about what she did and how she did it. And at the end of the conversation, she said, well, you know, Bill, that's just too bad that you can't come down here uh, and eat my placenta because I just gave birth and, uh, and that would be kind of cool. So I just like looked at the phone and I went, it, is, is this woman, has she just invited me to Plano, Texas to eat her placenta? Um, and so I, I thought to myself, if I write a book about cannibalism and I had this opportunity and it's 10 years down the road and I didn't do it, that I'd be kicking myself in the behind. So probably 10 minutes later, I had booked a flight to Texas, went down, met this woman. Um, and, and it was, it, 
to me, it was an adventure that you couldn't write if you were writing it as, a, as, as fiction because so much took place and it was so different than I thought it was gonna be. She had 10 homeschooled uh, uh, children. Um, and, um, and so there was a, a huge windstorm that had hit, the, had hit Plano the night before. It was just all of this kind of crazy stuff. And I get there and she says, well, my, my husband is a chef. You can have this however you want it. We can make a taco. He's got the whole chef's outfit on. Um, we can make a taco out of it. We can make it asabuco. So I'm uh, half Italian. And, and so uh, I said, yeah, let's do asabuco. So he cooked up all these fresh vegetables, uh, sauteed the, the placenta and, uh, and, and I ate it. And so, uh, and it was delicious. And, and, and a novelist could never have that uh, degree of imagination. At that. I, I would, and people ask me, you know, would you do it again? Why did you, and no, I would not do that again. I don't, I don't condone it. I don't think it's safe. I, 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 uh, I don't necessarily, you know, even she admitted that it was more the placebo effect than anything else. Right. Uh, but the placebo effect is very effective. And um, so, so it turned out to be a, you know, sort of a spectacular portion of the book that I, ne that I never thought uh, that I- But for have. the audience, I mean, you see what uh, great lengths uh, your authors will go to, to uh, pr provide you an authentic and uh, complete uh, uh, story. Oh, it was a lot of fun. So what's next? You've kind of gone A to Z from uh, fiction to nonfiction, and uh, yeah, uh, um, tell us what's uh, what's on store. Well, I finished up a, a trilogy, the uh, McCready uh, thriller, so that take place as a zoologist during World War II, and and uh, and and some of the adventures that he has with some very strange creatures in different places in the world, and and so so I'm moving on from that, and and my next. My next novel is going to be a solo novel, and it's going to be a young adult novel about uh, that about that, that takes place during World War II, and it's about a young Jewish girl and uh, and and her best friend who's uh, an autistic uh, teen. They're both 15 years old, so I'm I'm about three quarters of the way done with that, but I'm also um, working on the final edits now for Pump, uh, which is going to be about the uh, the 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 natural history of the heart and circulatory systems because there are it evolved several these things evolved on numerous occasions and i actually just signed up a, a contract with algonquin again a, a wonderful publisher um to write a book called bite which is going to be about the natural history of teeth cool so that's what i'm doing now and especially since i have time now that i'm retired so are you going to subject yourself to a heart transplant just so that you can write authoritatively about the pump? <laughs> no, I've written that already, and I, I, I hope to stay away from that. Uh, that Good type for of you. <laughs> Good for you. Well, gentlemen, that was a great conversation. Okay, the Slurpee <laughs> reference to both the spider and the, and the placenta. <laughs> just, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, audience. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Well, welcome to my world. <laughs> the, the, the visual of a spider slurpee i was just like oh my god <laughs> yes, and, and, and the verb that you use if you are a young spiderling in order to bring up the uh, slurpee uh, is is to snork oh. you snork it up through your little uh, proboscis <laughs> well you mentioned algonquin and both of your covers are absolutely fantastic i mean they just have done a great job on did you guys have any input in the covers at all or Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. They, uh, I, I insisted that the bones on the cover be uh, anatomically correct. Yeah, and at yeah. first they had a, a big old uh, shark jaw on it, which uh, was an impressive image. But uh, shark jaws are cartilage, not bone. Right, and, uh, won't go. Okay. Can't do it. Can't do it. Okay, we have a question here uh, for both of you. So we'll start. Um, you guys can decide who wants to answer it first. Um, this person's wondering if you think all biologists and doctors have an innate tendency towards what, quote, normal people would consider creepy or macabre. <laughs> Roy, go for it. <laughs> I remember when I first walked into the anatomy lab as a freshman a medical student, I had to turn around, walk out and sit down and uh, breathe in and breathe out for a while. And, and it was the same first time in the operating room. And when trainees come into the operating room for the first time now, I say, you know, it, it's your sympathetic nervous system. You have no control over it. And uh, if you begin to feel yourself getting lightheaded, uh, you, you know, sit down right away. Uh, don't be brave. And so um, I, we go into it with uh, normal human um, responses uh, and then we um, blunt them. Uh, but that I still 
remember back and try to treat all living beings with the uh, respect that I did uh, before I got deeply into biology. I still remember. I, I mean, I work at the American Museum of Natural History. I'm incredibly lucky to be able to have been there since I was a graduate student. And, 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 and so many of my friends there are just uber enthusiastic about things that most people, you know, one of my best friends is a, is a, uh, is a world famous bed bug expert. And so, you know, and the way he feeds them is he takes a, a, a jar with a, a thin mesh across the top and he puts it on his arm. Now, now this is not something that you would get, you know, your average insurance salesman or somebody with a normal nine to five job, but it's perfectly, uh, you know, it's perfectly normal for, for, for my friends to get excited about dinosaur bones or, or, uh, you know, bats is, uh, is a, a huge thing for us. You know, we've got 500 people that should be meeting this week in, in Tucson, but our meeting was canceled. All of us are bat research biologists. Uh, well, so and then, uh, you know, along those lines is that I cite several instances in, in Bones uh, about um, uh, orthopedic investigators who have experimented on themselves, have in, injected things under their skin, and all the way through the history of medicine is that uh, um, investigators uh, said, well, I need an experimental animal <laughs> and here I am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I guess the short answer is that uh, some of us are very weird and probably others are not so weird. The curious mind, right? <laughs> Definitely. Uh, and then uh, another question, Bill, have, were, have you been involved in other uh, museums of man? The question is specific about San Diego. Were you involved with, in that museum at all? No. Um, I mean, I, uh, where I have been doing some some research lately is at the Royal Ontario Museum in, in Toronto, and I went up there because they have a plastinated um, uh, blue whale heart, which weighs about 500 pounds. And I went to writing a book about uh, about the heart. I went there to to interview my friends about how they recovered that heart and the five year process that it took to uh, to get that thing preserved and looking the way it does. So, um, so mostly the American Museum of Natural History is that, that's really my home. I, um, I, I, it's really my favorite place in the world. Fantastic. Okay, and the last question for both of you, and we'll start with you, Roy. What do you, what do you read for enjoyment? What do you, what's your pleasure reading? I, I escape into uh, uh, popular culture, read The Economist, read Scientific American, um, can you know amuse myself with politics to no end. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty easy to do these days. <laughs> Bill, how about you? Um, a good horror book, um, a comedy by people like Christopher Moore. Uh, I'm a big fan of um, of E.O. Wilson's writings as far as like science for the masses. Um, a lot of biographies. I, I'm a I'm sort of a, an old punk rocker, so uh, a lot of a lot of uh, of music related biographies movies Fantastic. a lot of yeah. things about movies there's a book called coming out called featherhood and i can't think of the um uh musician that it's about um anyways look it up it's a really it's supposed to be a really good it's called featherhood um mm -hmm. it's coming out i think next year anyway so with that um roy do you have a website that people can go to if they're curious about finding out more about you what's it's my it's my blog site uh, www.aboutbone.com and then across the top a header you'll see the book and so you can uh, either look at my blog posts which i'd like it for you to do because there's okay. material there that's not in the book and, right. and then also uh, it'll link you right to the uh, book and it's about bone or about bones about bone okay no s okay that's it. about bone.com yeah Dot com. okay and how about you bill uh billshut.com i also have pages on uh i have a facebook page bill shut author uh twitter um, I'm a good reads as well, uh, Bill Shutt, author. Um, Perfect. So it's pretty easy to, 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 to look me up. Excellent. Well, this was a great conversation. I so appreciate you both taking the time with us tonight. And thank you. So I will take us off of Facebook Live. Good night, gentlemen. Thank, thank you, Julie. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Roy. Bye, Bill. <laughs> <laughs>